Hello, and welcome to Mindful Biology. In this five-part series about integrity, we'll look at how organisms are able to survive in environments that change frequently and sometimes dramatically. We'll see that the ability to survive depends on a resilience that derives from two complementary principles, that of connection and of separation. We'll come to feel how these two interplay in our own experience at the level of our cells, of the flowing energy in our bodies, at the level of our entire organism, that mammalian experience talked about in earlier series. And we'll see how it plays a role in our communities and indeed our whole civilization. So this is a important and central topic and I look forward to exploring it with you. Let's begin. Dictionaries define integrity in a couple of ways that I'll deal with in later talks. For today, I want to use a definition that comes from structural design, which refers to something called tensional integrity, sometimes shortened to tensegrity. The idea is that the structure consists of rigid elements that we see are looking rather like pencils. These are separated from one another and are connected together only by means of the string that passes through the eyelets. The advantage of this construction is that it tolerates deformation quite well without collapse. So there's a very powerful integrity that arises when there's a balance between separation and connection. And it's this form of integrity that I want to concentrate on today and through much of this series. Because this balance between separation and connection is central to life, as we will see. And we can experience it on the level of our mammalian bodies, the whole organism, our cellularity, that energetic feel of vibrancy or aliveness throughout the body, and at the communal level in our relationships and the entire society. Integrity is important all the way down to the basis of life. So we're looking here at a simple diagram of a single cell. And as we animate it and look inside, we notice that there is a lot of structure within. These are proteins, and other macromolecules that are vital to the cell's survival. So there is a need for the interior to be separated by a boundary so that what is important is kept within and what is dangerous is kept out. So there is separation. At the same time, the cell needs to be connected with its surroundings so that it can bring in nutrients and water and so on, and so that it can expel waste and signals to other cells, etc. The interplay and balance between separation and connection can be seen at a much higher level of organization, that of an ecosystem. So here we're looking at a food web so little organisms in the soil or water are eaten by small invertebrates that themselves are eaten by larger organisms going all the way up to the top predators. Now the top predators have a privileged position, in a certain sense similar to the position of the ruling class in any society. They are more protected from assault and yet their protection is, in a certain sense, illusory because they can always fall ill, they will age, and they will die. So even the top predators in the food web, although they don't have other organisms that prey upon them, they do end up becoming food for much smaller creatures, namely the bacteria and other microorganisms in the soil and water, which of course starts the cycle anew. So no matter how much an organism may attempt to maintain a position of privileged separation, there will always be connection, both in terms of the organism's need for resources and in terms of the fate of its tissues upon death. 
Now, I was a little young to be a hippie, but I came of age in the hippie era, and I internalized the idea that love and wholeness would conquer all. And so I have a natural tendency to think that connection is a good thing. And of course it can be when we're in the arms of someone that we love and feel passionate about, or when we work together to promote and support a healthier world, or even in a very simple act such as partaking of the earth's bounty, all of which are forms of connection and all of which feel positive to us. But in fact, connection can have a negative slant. So here two lionesses are attacking a water buffalo, attempting to connect with it in order to eat it. So although this is certainly a connection, it is not positive from the perspective of the buffalo. Certainly not. Or when there's an auto accident and two cars connect, that is, collide with each other, we don't think of that as at all positive. Or when an insect, such as a mosquito, connects with us and sucks our blood, we don't think of that as a positive connection. We would like to avoid all of these if we could. Or think of what happens to the body upon death. So here we're looking at a whale dead on the beach with a bloated interior. It's bloating because the bacteria that lived for its entire life within its intestines are now out of control, digesting the tissues and creating a lot of gaseous products that expand and bloat the body. During life, the bacteria were kept in check by a functioning immune system, but in death, they take over. Now, this process of decomposition is very natural, and it returns the materials of the dead body to the environment so that later generations of life can make use of them. But it's certainly not something we would want to initiate in our bodies before we actually died. So this is another type of connection, the connection between our microorganisms and our tissues that we want to prevent. That is, we want some kind of shield or armor or protection against the threats that our bodies face. This would be a good time to pause the video and contemplate in your own experience the different forms of connection that have felt positive or negative and also the forms of separation that feel positive or negative. But we'll move on. Now mammals, through evolutionary time, have devised a lot of ways to maintain separation. We can think of the quills of a porcupine or the hard covering of an armadillo. Even our own skin maintains separation, preventing our bodies from desiccating and thwarting the entry of bacteria and other pathogens in our environment. The way that we develop in a womb is also a healthy separation. The internal development separates the fetus from many environmental hazards. This is in contrast to an organism such as a sea urchin that releases hundreds of thousands of eggs into the water that begin as microscopic little organisms, most of which are eaten. What we call emotions are actually a way of maintaining separation. They give us information about our interior state and how it compares to prior states and our outer circumstances and how they compare, etc. And using all that information, we begin to get a sense of fear or anger or sorrow that lets us know that there's a problem and we need to do something to protect ourselves. But of course, a lot of the separation is maintained by a very sophisticated immune system. So we're looking here at a diagram of a lymph node and also a map of lymph node distribution in the body. And the widespread presence of lymph nodes in all different regions is an important indicator of how vital the immune system is to our well-being. Immunity is so vital that it isn't something restricted to complex organisms like ourselves. Even the simplest form of life, a bacterium, has an immune system. It's different from ours because, of course, the bacteria is very different. A bacterium is much, much smaller than our own human cells, by an order of about a thousand. And it's also much less complex internally. It doesn't have all those inner structures 
that we saw in the video at the start of this talk. And yet it does live and use resources, and it does need to protect itself from infectious threats. One such threat is viral infection. And there are many viruses that are able to incorporate their DNA into the bacterial genome where they can hide for long periods of time and only emerge when conditions are optimal for their replication and release into the environment, which allows them to then go on and infect more bacteria. The bacterium dies in that process, and so it's in its interest to remove such dangerous DNA. To do so, it employs, among other things, a system that has come to be known as CRISPR. You've probably heard about this because it's been in the news a lot uh, in recent years. It allows the bacterium to identify dangerous DNA, remove it from the genome, and then repair the break that's left behind. Now the CRISPR system is so important that organisms trade DNA that code for it amongst themselves, which allows them to expand the repertoire of viruses that they can defend against. So a bacterium that survives a viral infection and develops a CRISPR element that works for it, can transfer that element in the form of a DNA code to other bacteria, thus spreading the protection to its companions. Now, once the new DNA gets into the cell of the bacterium, it needs to be incorporated into the bacterial genome. And so this is a situation where connection is needed. So on the one hand, there is a call for separation to remove the dangerous viral DNA. And on the other, there's a need for connection to incorporate this protective CRISPR information. Well, the reason the CRISPR system has been in the news is that we as humans have learned how to use it to modify our own genes and the genes of other organisms. The proximal discovery of the CRISPR system and its application in molecular biology was accomplished by two scientists, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, both of whom won the Nobel Prize. But although this was an impressive body of work that they contributed to the world, it depended on an enormous amount of work done by prior scientists over several generations. So this kind of technological improvement depends on a sort of connection. It also depends on the connection that is enabled by our human hands that we'll discuss in later talks of this series, and I'm introducing a little bit of the anatomy with this nice diagram here. We'll come back to that. The point for now is that by connecting with other humans, we have become very powerful as a species. Now, there is still an element of separation. We remain individuals. We're born individually. We live our individual lives. But by coming together and connecting, we are able to accomplish things that other organisms have not been able to accomplish. And it led over time to our ability to live in cooperative communities that included not only other humans, but also domestic animals, as shown in this diorama. This has been a very powerful skill, this capacity of humans to come together, to connect, and to work cooperatively. So here we see that integrity that comes from the connection between separate elements. The development of human society to this level took a long time. The overall time frame was about 3.7 billion years to get from a form more or less like a bacterium to these complex but still relatively technologically unsophisticated villages that existed at the dawn of history. Since then, our cultures have developed much faster so that we now have these highly complex systems of nations and huge metropolitan areas and vast communications networks and agricultural systems and so on. And while this is very impressive and is keeping billions of people alive on earth at this moment 
it also has accumulated a lot of toxicities, both in terms of environmental effects and also in terms of social strife and division. It calls into question whether we can continue as a complex civilization or whether the whole structure of it will crumble and collapse. If we lose the integrity that's required for our civilization to continue, it will be in part because we have become so separated. Our culture obviously emphasizes the individual over the community. And communities themselves are often very separated from one another. And we see this evident in all the political division. And our industrial systems have established a strong separation from the environment, procuring minerals and releasing wastes without much regard for the effect on the biosphere. So we could say that our society is currently threatened by an imbalance where there is too much separation and not enough connection of the right kind. Now we'd surely like to change our behavior so that the future of our civilization was no longer in question. To do that will require a restoration of the healthy balance between connection and separation, that is, a return to healthy integrity. As we pursue this goal, we can learn from and be inspired by life and its history of evolution. In particular, the progression from single-celled organism to complex multicellular life forms that took all those billions of years can provide us insight into what our society needs in order to restore healthy integrity. We'll look at what evolution can tell us in later talks of this series. These lessons will be needed on all levels, the individual, our communities, our institutions, our nations, and our technologies. But we, taking a class like this, are more limited in our possibilities, at least at first. We have to begin by establishing a healthier balance between feelings of separation and connection and a more robust integrity in our own individual experience. And then we can connect with others as we learn to be more balanced and inspire and help our whole society to gradually regain a healthy degree of integrity. It's been shown, for instance, that in a community of smokers, if one person quits, that increases the likelihood of that person's closest contacts quitting. And over time, the rate of smoking can decline simply by the actions taken by individuals at the outset. And so we can have a very powerful effect on our communities and by extension on our institutions and our nations and our technologies by beginning with ourselves. And that's what we'll be working toward in this series about integrity, finding ways to understand our own interior experience and our own biology in service of greater degrees of integrity, ease, and equanimity.